Hi guys, um, welcome to our final exam review. Um, I'm gonna go over very briefly all of the topics that we've covered this year in biology, um, starting with the very beginning. But keep in mind that all of these topics have been covered in a lot more detail in your notebook throughout the year. So I'm just kind of going to touch on the highlights to refresh you. I'm also going to be giving you a study guide. That study guide is based directly on the questions that will be on the exam. So any of these things that you're confused about, you should first go back in your notebook and find your notes and review those. And then if you can't find any notes, you should ask a friend or um, look back even in the book to find these topics. Um, all right, so the topics that we've covered this year thus far are DNA and RNA, macromolecules, organ systems, homeostasis, the carbon cycle, photosynthesis, and cellular respiration. And all of these are going to appear on your final exam. So to start off with, I just want to refresh you on DNA. DNA is a macromolecule. Um, it is a double helix. That's what we call the twisted ladder structure of DNA. It has four bases. They are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, or as you more commonly see them, A, T, G, and C. Um, DNA is always found in the nucleus of a cell, and it never leaves the nucleus of the cell. That's something very important about it. DNA contains all of your genetic information, and DNA codes for how to make a protein. Now, because DNA does not leave the nucleus, there is RNA, and RNA does leave the nucleus to create proteins. RNA is a single-sided copy of DNA, and um, it is just one half of what the DNA molecule is. Now, there's some differences between DNA. Um, other than being double-stranded versus single-strand, RNA has one base that is different. It has adenine, cytosine, and guanine, but instead of thymine, it has something called uracil. So if you're looking at a molecule that contains uracil, you should automatically know that that has to be DNA. I'm sorry, RNA. Wow. Woo, RNA. All right, uh, we discussed the four major macromolecules that make up living organisms. Um, macro means big. So when we're talking about macromolecules, we're talking about lots and lots and lots of atoms stuck together to make these giant molecules. And the four main classes are nucleic acids, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. So to start off with, we just reviewed nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. They are what contain your genetic information. All living organisms contain DNA or RNA. Most have both. Um, and they are there as the blueprint for how to make all of the other things. Now, um, lipids are the second class of macromolecules we discussed. Lipids are things like fats and oils. Um, so if you think about olive oil, if you ever put olive oil in water, um, it doesn't mix with water. So that's one of its properties. A property of lipids is that they don't dissolve in water. Um, fats and oils are used as long-term energy storage molecules. So when you eat a meal, and you don't use all of that energy immediately, what your body does is it converts it into fat molecules, which is an efficient way to store that energy long term. Also, fats have a lot more energy per gram than carbohydrates do. So it's a lot of compact energy. Um, another thing that lipids are used for is to provide insulation. So down here, this walrus, a lot of marine mammals use blubber as it's basically a really thick fat layer blubber and that is for insulation so it's really good at keeping you warm um, also lipids are used as sort of a cushioning like you can think of lipids like the bubble wrap of your body so all of your organs all of your um, all of your major organs in your body are covered with a layer of fat so fats do a lot for us um, the third macromolecule we discussed are carbohydrates, and these are our energy molecules. They're sugars, um, things like glucose, fructose, galactose. These are all carbohydrates, and typically we think about carbohydrates, we think about like bread and pasta products, things like that. But in truth, almost all the food we eat has carbohydrates in it because that's how we get our quick energy. Our body's very good at breaking down these carbohydrates. So 
Um, down here, I have a glucose molecule, and this is the basic carbohydrate. This is made, remember, by plants during photosynthesis. So plants have the ability to take in energy from the sun and turn it into a chemical form. So the energy is actually held within the bonds of the glucose molecule. So this is... Um, this is amazing because we can't do that as consumers. We have to eat glucose and that's what we do. We eat carbohydrates every day. It's needed by all organisms that are consumers. All right, the final macromolecule is proteins. And proteins are, are very complex molecules and their building block is something called amino acids. And there are 20 amino acids um, and some of them we get from our food, some of them we're capable of actually making, um, but these 20 amino acids account for all of the proteins that our body has. So if you think about amino acids being like an alphabet, all 20 of them can arrange in lots and lots of different orders to create different proteins. And they are um, told what order to be in by the DNA. So DNA directly codes for RNA and RNA directly codes for proteins. So down here, this is showing you different amino acids and the way that they are put together will impact the form of the protein. And depending on the shape of the protein, it can do different jobs. So um, for example, one protein that your body uses is hemoglobin and hemoglobin attaches um, or oxygen attaches itself to hemoglobin and hemoglobin is found in your red blood cells that's what allows your red blood cells to pick up the hemo or pick up the oxygen from your lungs and deliver it to the rest of your body it's totally reliant on that shape of the protein so if the amino acids aren't in the right order it won't necessarily turn into the right protein and if it's not the correct shape the protein might not do its job um, proteins do hundreds of functions. They do things like sending chemical messages. So hormones are proteins. Um, they make up parts of your body. Your muscle is made out of a lot of protein. Um, they sometimes perform chemical reactions. So a lot of the enzymes that help you digest things, those are proteins. Proteins are doing so much stuff all the time. Um, if it's not done by a lipid or a carbohydrate or a nucleic acid, it's done by a protein. They're really like the powerhouses. All right, so we have these macromolecules and they come together to form um, cells and cells that come together form, or cells that work together to perform a function are called tissue. Tissue that works together will form an organ and organs that work together will form an organ system. And you have several organ systems in your body and those organ systems are working together to perform a specific function that helps you stay alive. So here's some main organ systems that you might want to remember. Um, for example, your digestive system. This is the system that's responsible for breaking down your food and helping you to absorb the nutrients. Your circulatory system is responsible for sending nutrients and oxygen to all the cells of your body. So your circulatory system is made up of your blood, your blood vessels, and your heart. It also helps remove waste from the cells. So think to cellular respiration. As all of your cells are demanding oxygen, it's your circulatory system that delivers that oxygen to them and also picks up the carbon dioxide so it can exit your body. Your urinary system removes waste from your body, so we're constantly making something called nitrogenous waste that has to be excreted through urine. Respiratory system is what is responsible for gas exchange. So your respiratory system includes your nose, your trachea, your lungs, um, and that helps bring oxygen in and release carbon dioxide. Your muscular system is responsible for movement and balance and even things that we might not typically think of with the muscular system like your diaphragm. So um, right below your rib cage, you have a muscle called your diaphragm. And as your diaphragm moves, it allows your lungs to inflate or deflate, allowing for gas exchange to happen. So a lot of these systems work together to perform a function. For example, 
your circulatory system is responsible for moving the oxygen around your body. But if it weren't for the respiratory system, which brings the oxygen in in the first place, it wouldn't happen. Or your muscular system is responsible for actually allowing your lungs to inflate. So if you don't have your muscular system, you can't breathe and thus you can't get oxygen into your body. So they're really all working together. And when one organ system fails, it can have a, a ripple effect on all of the other organ systems. All right, speaking of organ systems keeping you together, um, the idea that inside of your body you have a constant internal environment, that's called homeostasis. And we are capable of maintaining homeostasis which means this internal environment inside of my body is the same regardless of what's going on outside. So you think about sitting in a really cold classroom or going outside when it's really hot, regardless of the temperature or the conditions outside, inside your body is the same. And your body has several mechanisms for dealing with situations that might come up that um, would otherwise change your internal conditions. For example, if your temperature decreases, like if you go outside and it's really cold and your internal temperature starts to decrease, your muscles will start to twitch and that will allow you to shiver and you're going to generate some heat that way. Um, if you go outside and it's super hot and your body starts to warm up too much, you start to sweat and that is a way of your body cooling it, itself down. Um, that's by evaporative cooling. If you're running, let's say you're at track practice and your mitochondria have used up all of their oxygen, your brain is going to tell your lungs to breathe in more and your heart rate is going to increase to get that oxygen to your cells even faster. So no matter what's going on outside or no matter what conditions your body is put in, it has ways of trying to maintain that internal balance. All right. Something else we discussed this semester was the carbon cycle. Now, um, we talked about the fact that there is the law of conservation of matter, which states that matter is neither created nor destroyed. Carbon is neither created nor destroyed. It does, however, change forms. So um, we have a lot of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and it is taken out of our atmosphere in two ways. The first way is through photosynthesis. So plants can actually capture that carbon dioxide and turn it into glucose or it can be diffused into the ocean. So once carbon is out of the atmosphere, let's say it goes into a plant here, um, the plant may store it or the plant may be eaten by another animal, in which case the carbon is transferred to that animal and the animal may breathe out and that carbon might be returned to the atmosphere. Land plants also breathe out. Plants also, well, they don't breathe out, but they respire. So they're doing respiration as well as photosynthesis. So the same carbon that a plant takes in, it might also respire out. Um, when plants and animals die, they are recycled by detritivores, things that break them down. And those organisms will basically return that carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, or sometimes that carbon will sit in the soil. Um, another way that carbon returns to the atmosphere, sometimes through basically diffusion um, from the ocean from where it was diffused in the first place. That's confusing. Carbon can diffuse in and out of water is all I'm saying. Um, there are some ways where humans are definitely impacting this cycle. One of them is through combustion of fossil fuels. So we are taking fossil fuels out of the ground, things like coal and gasoline, and we're burning them. And we know that when we burn something, it doesn't disappear forever. The law of conservation of matter says it goes somewhere and it usually goes to our atmosphere. The other thing that we're doing is you can see this plant or this tree here cut down. We are destructing or destroying forests. And as we clear forests, we are taking the carbon that was stored in that tree. And if it's burned, it's returned back to the atmosphere. And additionally, when we take that tree and cut it down, it can no longer do photosynthesis. So it's not going to take the carbon back out of the atmosphere. Excuse me. 
Um, there are some other ways that carbon can be cycled in and out of our atmosphere. Some of the geologic ways like volcanoes. I'm not too concerned about you knowing since this is a biology class, but understand this picture isn't the end of the carbon cycle. There are still some other things. Now we also talked about energy cycling in ecosystems and there's the law of conservation of energy, which says that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So within an ecosystem, organisms are getting their energy from either making their food, making their glucose, so they're a producer, they're usually a plant, or they're a consumer, they're eating their food. These are animals, for the most part. Um, but there's something called the rule of 10%. And if you recall, what that says to us is that every time um, an organism is eaten, that not all of the energy is transferred. So 90%, in fact, is lost. It's not in a usable form for that next organism. 10% um, is. So this image here is showing that in an ecosystem on the African savanna, there are lions. And if the lion gets needs 10 calories of food, 10 kilocalories or calories with a capital C, um, then it would have to have 100 calories of zebra, and then the zebras would have had to eat 1,000 calories of grass or tree matter. So every time we move up those levels, those trophic levels, they're called, we lose energy. Now, all right, on to photosynthesis. This is a part of this carbon and energy cycle, a huge part of it. Plants are responsible, because they can do photosynthesis, they're responsible for taking carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and turning it into glucose. They also, during that process, create oxygen, which is great news for us who need oxygen. This all happens in an organelle called the chloroplast, and the chloroplast contains a pigment called chlorophyll, and that's what makes plants green. Um, photosynthesis is only done by producers, so humans don't do photosynthesis. We have to consume our, um, our energy and we have to eat our carbon in the form of glucose. But plants are unique in that they can use the energy from the sunlight and they can use the carbon from the atmosphere to create glucose, which is a usable form of energy by you and me. So cellular respiration happens in something called the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is an organelle found in every cell, plant or animal. Plants, although they make their glucose, they also need to break it down to create energy. And that's what cellular respiration is all about. So in order for cellular respiration to occur, you need to first consume glucose, or if you're a plant, make it. And you also need oxygen. So the real reason why we are breathing in right now and the reason why our bodies need oxygen is not because we just need it for some reason. We need it because oxygen is an important part of the cellular respiration process. And without oxygen, we can't make a lot of energy and we can't make enough energy to support our lives. So we do need oxygen. And in the process of cellular respiration in the mitochondria, um, ATP is made and ATP is a fancy way of saying cellular energy. It's the energy that our cells can use to grow, to move, to do things. It also makes water, which is a byproduct, and carbon dioxide, which is what we breathe out. So if you look at the picture on the screen of cellular respiration, you'll notice that cellular respiration is the exact opposite of photosynthesis. So cellular respiration requires oxygen and glucose, gives off carbon dioxide, energy, and water, while photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of sunlight, and it will create oxygen and glucose. So that concludes my kind of mini review of all of these topics. Um, like I said, if there was a part of this, if there was a topic list at the beginning that you didn't understand, go back to your notes. I guarantee you, you have something on it. And if you don't, somebody in your class does. So now what you're going to do is complete the study guide that has been given to you. That was based directly off of the exam questions. The exam will be 36 multiple choice question and one constructed response. So it's a three part short answer. Um, this should be a fairly 
Simple and straightforward exam for you, especially if you do the study guide. So best of luck, work hard, study the answers, and try to have fun. <laughs> Bye.